Art Club has always been a forum for public figures, thought leaders, and decision makers to share their ideas. Here, we offer access to dynamic political, business, and public personalities. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joseph Flo, and I'm president-elect of Canadian Club Toronto and a partner of TWC. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. We are grateful for the opportunity to be able to come together to learn on this land. Canada benefits from a robust immigration system. As we emerge from the pandemic, how will immigration contribute to our recovery? And how do we keep Canada as a destination of choice for economic migrants and skilled workers? Today, we're joined by the Honorable Sean Fraser and Goldie Hyder for a discussion on the key role of immigration in Canada's post-pandemic economic recovery. Before we hear from today's speakers, I want to review a few housekeeping items. Please take note of the following. The click here to switch stream button helps if you find that your internet is slow. The video quality may decrease, but the audio quality should remain strong. Once you click the questions tab, you can enter your questions in the window and they will be sent to our moderator. The request help button located in the bottom right corner of the page is there for technical support. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for helping to make this event possible. Thanks to the generous support of RBC and Arrive, an RBC Ventures company, today's event is free of charge. The Canadian Club is a nonprofit and we have been gathering people together for 125 years. It is because of our sponsors, partners and club members that we are able to do so. So thank you for your continued support. Now to introduce today's speakers, the Honorable Sean Fraser, is Canada's Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. The Minister has served as the MP for Central Nova since his election in 2015. Goldie Hyder is President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada. Today's discussion will be moderated by Jenny Lamb, President of Wattpad and a Director of Canadian Club Toronto. Another tradition of our club maintains is the toast we make to our country. So if you have a beverage close by, please join me in a toast to Canada. And now it's my pleasure to turn things over to our moderator, Jenny. Thank over you for that you. intro, Joe. It's really nice to uh, be in the presence of Goldie and Minister Fraser, who I'll refer to as Sean going forward, just for ease of time. And uh, I wanted to just share that we have over 350 RSVPs for this conversation. So clearly a lot of very, very interested interest and passion and perspectives to be had here. Um, and we have attendees from industries in finance, professional services, law firms, as well as post-secondary institution refugee placement services. Uh, and so the goal of our discussion today is for us to better understand how immigration is meant to address some of Canada's most pressing economic and society, societal issues, post-pandemic recovery, demographic decline, global unrest. Um, I have a feeling this is gonna be a very interesting conversation having seen the two of you already interact. So uh, let's, let's just start there. 
So I'm going to start by uh, with a very simple question, which, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of context first. In, in December, Prime Minister Trudeau published his mandate letter that called on the Ministry of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, IRCC, to do something that even those of us who don't work for the PM are very familiar with. Hit more aggressive targets, improve on all your key metrics and do it faster. So before we get started, uh, Sean, I'd love to have you just maybe introduce very briefly uh, the high level different immigration categories that exist before we get into this mandate that's been passed down. Look, thanks so much, Jenny, and thank you to everyone in attendance today. It's an absolute uh, privilege to be with you to discuss an issue that's uh, a real passion of mine, and that's uh, the role that immigration can play in, in growing the economy. Um, just before I introduce the, the three very brief categories, I just want to say that we don't necessarily sit down and, and set our mission to set a record for the most ambitious immigration levels of all time. We're trying to figure out how can we solve problems most effectively to help grow the economy. And it just so happens that immigration is going to be the key that's going to help drive the economy. So to answer Jenny's question, there's effectively three categories of immigration. There's economic immigration, there's family reunification, and there is uh, humanitarian and refugee resettlement. By introducing a mix of these policies with a strong focus on economic immigration, we're going to help solve the later labor shortage and grow the economy, which is going to be essential for the well-being of Canadians as we seek to recover from the pandemic. Thank you for that high-level inter in introduction. Now, to your point about achieving the highest level targets ever, um, Canada achieved its 2021 targets welcoming over 400,000 new permanent residents, um, which I think is the highest number since 1913. Uh, and we're, you know, uh, going to hit some new targets this year, up from our original target of 411,000 to now 432,000. And so can you uh, help us understand what's driving the 2022 mandate and these increase in targets? Absolutely. So look, I'm coming from this uh, from a point of view where the post-pandemic recovery is going to require the entire government of Canada focus on policies that are designed to foster economic growth. When I look at where we are at right now, uh, at the end of the year, we had seen 107% of the jobs lost during the pandemic had been recovered. GDP had exceeded post-pandemic levels. Our labor force participation rate was at near an all-time high, let alone the beginning of the pandemic. Notwithstanding these really, really successful metrics when I compare us to other economies around the world, we also had 900,000 job vacancies. This is an opportunity, if there ever was one, to bring more workers to Canada to help foster economic growth. That's not only going to help find work for the people who come here, it's going to help sustain Canadian jobs for people who've been sitting with the uncertainty, not knowing whether their employer was going to be able to weather the storm of COVID. But it's also going to help ensure that we as governments have the means to continue to fund the social services that make us very proud to be Canadian, like a robust public health care system, like strong public education, like the basic services in our community and the social safety net. To me, this is a no brainer. My mindset is always to say, identify problems, solve problems. There is a labor shortage. We need workers. We can find workers from all over the world because Canada remains a destination of choice. And the 432,000 uh, reflects the capacity of our department to welcome as many as we can to fill these jobs in the labor force. So one of the um, biggest challenges I think we've seen, and, and Goldie, I'm gonna lean on you here. You've been very vocal in urging the government to expand the immigration systems processing capacity and detailing some very specific actions even in a recent Globe and Mail article. Could you share what challenges we're facing in bringing you know, immigrants to Canada and, and is the government doing enough to be able to hit these targets? Well, thanks uh, for the question, Jenny. And Minister, great to be with you. Thank you for having, having me and thank you for all for joining. Look, there's, there's uh, three truths about Canada and our economic growth that we need to recognize. It is contingent upon our ability to be a trading nation because of the resources that we have. It is contingent upon the, our ability to attract capital so that we can actually develop the projects that are necessary to do the things to move uh, goods and services around the country and around the world. But central to that, the most critical piece, I would argue, is the reliance we have on immigration. It is the sole source of GDP growth for, for a long period of time now. Um, we have a demographic challenge. I'm sure the minister has better numbers than I do, but you know, just back in the 70s or so, we had about seven people working to pay for one retiree. Today, we're down to, to about three to one. And you know what that means. It means that as we're heading in that direction, it's going to go to two to one. And that means people are going to have to either work longer, work harder, pay more taxes, or give up things like their quality of life and their standard of living. So we feel very strongly that maintaining support for immigration is actually job one. 
we have to make sure that we don't take for granted that people believe everything that Sean and I are going to say today, right? And we have to convince them that, look, this is the way in which we help improve your life and your quality of life. So before we look to outside, what we first do as business leaders say, who's available to me right now, right here? Because that's the easy thing. We continue to see a lot of underutilized people. Women were underutilized. Why we advocated for childcare. As much as it's a social policy, it's really an economic policy. So we're happy to be endorsing that 100%. Um, you look at Indigenous groups, 50% of the Indigenous communities below the age of 25, they're, they want to work, they want to get an education, they want to be skilled and reskilled, they're available to us, let's make sure uh, we tap into that. People with disabilities, uh, people who's, who've come to Canada on the basis of their foreign skills being properly recognized that have not been properly recognized. So we have in-home solutions or on, in, inside Canada solutions we need to address. But here's the, the, the rub of it all. If we get 100% of those people working, we still won't have enough. And that's why this conversation is so important today is how do we get to that second half of this and ensure that we get the right people here? And I'm sure we'll get into that as the afternoon goes on. Uh, can you share a little bit more of, you know, when you say maintain support for immigration, do you feel that there is enough support for it at this point? Uh, and is it clear to businesses what needs to be done in order to gain that support? Well, look, um, we're not immune from the global forces that are taking place around the world. The, the polarization, the popular, the populism, the, you know, the urban rural divides, all of these things are, they could come to Canada. In some cases, some would argue, as I'm locked out of my office at Ground Zero in Ottawa, have come to Canada. And we need to do something about that. I think what it is, is Canadians are a really smart group of people. Uh, we should trust them. We should engage them with information, would give them data, give them the ability to think and discuss and debate and yet yeah, disagree about certain things. But what I've seen is we've engaged all of the political parties in the last three elections and said, do us one favor. Please don't politicize this issue. I get politics with the best of them. Do whatever you have to do. You know, go at it. Just don't touch this issue because it is so core to the well-being of our society, to the economic, social, social prosperity of our country. And to, to their credit, they've listened. Uh, you know, political party after political party, with the exception of one, has, has gone in another direction and has been rewarded with zero seats in parliament. But the ones in the mainstream parties have all been advocates for a responsible immigration system. I think we have arguably one of the most toughest immigration systems in the world. Some would argue it's discriminatory. We call and screen for everything from your age to your employability, to your health, to your education, to your criminality. Good, that's exactly what builds confidence in our system because people know that you've been selected. This is not some lottery that you're winning here. You've been selected because we feel you can contribute, you can be successful, but now we need to do our part when they get here. So businesses are looking at that and saying, what can I do? I can help you onboard better. Right? I can help you train when you, when you come over here. Um, I can help you with, with um, accreditation issues, right? I mean, a lot of these accreditation issues are professional bodies where people need some time. Let us find a way to give you some time to be able uh, to do that. Providing support for families with daycares and other things that are available through, through, through corporations and things. Businesses can make it possible for the potential of the immigrant who comes to Canada to be realized, because if we don't, it's a lose-lose proposition. It's not like any one of us win as a result of that. We all lose, and most importantly, we run the risk of losing support for immigration. And I think Canadians understand this. We just need to make sure they realize the facts. And the facts are the numbers, uh, you know, labor shortage numbers are very real. And if we don't foster the growth, it's going to jeopardize the quality of life and standard of living of the average family. So, Sean, you know, I, I think that I, Goldie makes a very good point in being able to really demonstrate to immigrants that businesses here are committed to their success, to onboarding them accreditation, a lot more than to be done there. I'm curious if you're seeing how we're faring in, in, in the global talent fight. It's so intense in terms of bringing the economic migrants to Canada. It's so intense, especially in, in my field in, in, in technology. And we can see how there are so many industrial nations really trying to fight for the same talent. Do you feel that we are, is Canada doing a good job of, att of attracting this top talent and given the global intensity? Uh, look, thanks for that question. I think it's an important one. And there is no question in my mind that we are in a race for global talent. Uh, but there's also no question in my mind that we are winning the race for global talent. The only question is, can we increase the margin by which we are winning that race? Because I think we need to pull out all the stops to make sure we attract as much talent that can be uh, filling gaps in the labor force that can't be filled with people who are living in our communities right now. 
one of the things that I, I'm reflecting on over the past 24 hours, I had an incredible conversation with a group that focuses on welcoming refugees as economic immigrants yesterday. And we uh, found ourselves in a discussion about how the welcoming nature of Canadian communities and the Canadian business community is an enormous competitive advantage for the Canadian economy writ large. Uh, I would add though, that it's really important that it, it's not just the employer who needs to be welcoming to help us win that. It's a combination of policies and the supports that exist within communities. Uh, one of the things that I'm seeing is when I talk to people about the global talent stream, that under normal circumstances can get somebody here in a few weeks if they really have an acute labor need, is something that the business community is all over. The growth in the tech sector in Toronto as a result of this and related programs is really a, a, a proof point to the, to the fact that if you do have open doors and a welcoming attitude, you're going to attract that talent who maybe doesn't think it's as easy to find themselves in a competitor economy. But just one point to build on, on uh, Goldie's argument that we need to continue our support for immigration. This is very much a, a ground level thing that we need to deal with. I reflect on this not so much in my position as Minister of Immigration, but as a member of parliament for small towns and rural communities in Northern Nova Scotia. You know, we are notoriously friendly, uh, but I don't think we've been as welcoming over the course of our history as we could have been. Uh, when I first was elected, some of the things that I was hearing about that was most controversial was the closure of a school and the loss of a mental health unit at our regional hospital. Now we've embraced immigration to fill gaps in the labor force through the Atlantic Immigration Program, to help employers find workers. We embrace the Syrian refugee resettlement. People have met newcomers and they really enjoy the dyn dynamism they bring to our community. And now the debates we're having is do we have enough to support to ensure their settlement is successful because so many people are coming rather than the fact that we might be losing essential services because so many young people are leaving as was the course over the, the course of my life up until the last five or six years. It's really been wonderful to see uh, how attitudes can change and become more, more welcoming and success breeds success when you see communities, business and policy all create an atmosphere that is designed to welcome newcomers to fill gaps in the labor force. Uh, if I can give credit where credit's due, Jenny, I, I think, you know, uh, both the minister and, and his predecessor and the government has been trying to address some of the issues that, that he has raised. Uh, the pilot project, for example, you know, uh, it was wildly successful and, and I think it's become permanent if I, if, I, if, I, if I understood properly in your last announcement. So it's an indication that policy matters, that we actually need to be deliberative and creative in responding to these things, because the truth is, the world is changing. It's changing very quickly. And what got us here is not going to get us there. And so we have to work at it and work at it in a partnership with business and government and labor and academia and others to say, what do we need to do to win in that talent war? Because the minister is absolutely right. It, the, the intensity with which um, businesses are competing, the landscape in which we're operating now, uh, you snooze, you lose. You take too long, they're gone. Um, we will always get people to come here. Let me be clear. There will never be a shortage of people lining up in embassies around the world wanting to come to Canada. Why not? We're heaven on earth, right? But are they who you want? Are they who you need? Are they the people that are going to be able to be uh, responding to your labor shortage crisis? Are they going to be able to come here and, and contribute and add value and build a life and build a family? We've got to, we've got to exercise our judgment, which, which I support fully in us doing that. But I think we have to recognize that, that what got us here, that system needs to be updated. It needs to be modernized. We need to respond to the reaction, uh, to, the, to the environment in which we're operating. So speed is one of those things, right? We've got this massive backlog. Uh, I believe, I'm hoping the minister is successful in making his case to his colleague, the finance minister, but we need resources allocated to this because that's the lowest hanging fruit. These are people who've, been, who've applied or available and eligible to come and we can't get them here fast enough. We need them desperately. So we are, um... It's really nice to see we're getting a, a lot of audience questions in and really encourage everyone to keep asking those questions. And it, it's exactly on what you're talking about, Goldie, which is the concern around the backlog. Sean, can you tell us more about what we're doing, knowing that we have many eligible people in the queues waiting and there's a lot of fear that we're gonna lose them as a result? Uh, absolutely, and look, this uh, this item has my, my full attention. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm pleased about is it's an identifiable, pro uh, identifiable problem and a solvable problem. Uh, it will take resources, it will take a little bit of time, but we're not uh, sitting on our hands here. So I think before you figure out the right strategy to solve these kinds of problems, you have to understand where these problems originate. And when I look at what's happened over the past two years to our immigration system, when our borders were closed to protect the public against the spread of COVID-19 in our communities, it required us to pivot to welcome more people who were already inside Canada 
to meet the needs of our communities, to meet the needs of our labor force. That was the right thing to do at the time, but we knew that was going to have uh, impacts down the line because if you're focusing on welcoming more people who are already here, the inventory of people who want to come here from overseas is going to grow. And of course, what we've seen as is not only people who were already in the queue, as Goldie pointed out, Canada is a destination of choice for a whole suite of good reasons. We continue to see significant numbers of people who are continuing to apply. So we effectively have a few years worth of applications that have been made because we had to pivot to meet the needs of our economy during the pandemic to welcome more people that were already here. In addition, the spread of COVID-19 has had an impact on our operations because certain jurisdictions where we operate don't allow people to work from home safely. We don't have the ability to keep offices open in New Delhi the way we might uh, when we can pivot to a work from home uh, approach in Canada. Uh, these are very real challenges. Uh, but that said, there are things we can do and are already doing to solve them. And number one, uh, increase your immigration levels. You're not going to reduce the number of cases in the inventory if you welcome fewer people each year. Number two, put resources immediately to where you identify bottlenecks in the process. The economic and fiscal update profiled $85 million towards work permits, towards study permits, towards temporary residency visas, proof of citizenship, and PR cards. Those are areas where we were seeing real bottlenecks in the system. But the long-term solution is something I'm incredibly excited about. We are on the precipice of a pivot to a modern and digital system. We've got new features that started to come on in the recent months and will be coming on more fully in the months ahead. We're going to allow for digital intake on 17 different lines of business by this summer. We've already got a PR case tracker that's online now for family reunification. So people don't have to call a uh, over jammed uh, IRCC call center or their MP's office to get a status update on where their case is at. The update's gonna be in their pocket today. We've got new uh, functionalities that have come online when it comes to citizenship applications and virtual ceremonies. There are many more elements to come, but the reality is it's the 21st century. We have to decide, are we gonna use modern technology and all the benefits that it provides to ensure that we can have an efficient and effective process that will prevent more people who are looking at coming to Canada that may have already applied uh, from thinking about some other jurisdiction. We want these people here and the digital tools that we're implementing are gonna help us get there. I think there's going to be a lot of relief to hear that these measures are being implemented. I think there's also questions around, um, are we going to be doing anything temporarily in the meantime to extend work permits in Canada for folks that are already here and about to lose it? And so is that something that's being contemplated or can you share more? Uh, certainly. So this is something that we're looking at right now. And I would point out that, in fact, we, we establish a, a whole range of different programs during the pandemic. The, the chief example would be the TR to PR program for people who maybe had temporary status uh, or in some cases like the Guardian Angel programs who uh, may, may not have been able to stay in Canada, but were providing essential services during the pandemic. There's some incredible lessons that have been learned. And we've been working with the Canadian Labour Congress in a, with a pilot in the construction sector to make sure that workers who don't even have status are going to be able to stay on the job so we don't exacerbate the problem with the labour shortage that we're already facing. You'll look at my mandate letter and you'll see that I'm actually mandated by the Prime Minister uh, to establish new programs that establish a pathway to permanent residency for people who are here on a temporary status, whether it's temporary foreign workers, whether it's international students, or others who are making a positive contribution to the economy that won't be able to stay here if we don't take action. So we're looking right now at the best policy options to make sure that we don't exacerbate problems. We are doing what we can to expedite work permits, including as part of that $85 million investment that will get us back to the service standard pre-pandemic that we used to enjoy. So this has my, my full attention and it's really exciting because I think it's a, a huge opportunity, not just to increase our immigration levels, but to find the people who are here making a contribution now to give them certainty that they can stay, which is not just going to give them peace of mind, but their community and their employer as well. I think it's it's very important that we take action on this issue. I was just going to say, Jenny, one of the things that matters from the business side uh, of, of the coin for this is the need to match, right? It's, we've got to make sure that the labor that's coming in is the labor that's required and that's needed. So again, I think we need to, to take a look. I'm not suggesting you know to, to, to gut the thing and, and change it all, but we need to take a look at the mechanism, at the model, at the questions that we've been asking for 40 years about what it takes to come in here and reflect on the changes that have taken place in society, the needs that are necessary here today, uh, and say, you know, is what we needed 30 years ago or even 20 years ago the same as what we need today? And what we might need five or 10 years from now, because you can look down the window and say, or down the road and say, listen, I need uh, STEM students. I need people who are going to be helping me with cyber and AI and quantum 
algorithm and coding and all kinds of things. So there's a broader societal conversation to have here. Countries are revamping their education systems and teaching AI in junior high school. Are we looking at doing that? We have to have a more holistic response to our economic growth uh, agenda here because the threat is very real. I mean, I just want to underscore, this is not fear mongering, but there are consequences when jobs go unfulfilled. You know, um, businesses will either look to automate, businesses will look to outsource, the projects will be delayed, uh, projects could be moved and relocated to another country. People say, well, maybe I don't care, but, but you need to care because that's what paves your road. That's what pays for your hospital bed. That's what puts your kids in school. That's what keeps your kids tuition down because somebody else is willing to pay two, three times what, what, what your kid is paying, right? We've, we've got to connect the dots for people and remind them uh, of this. We used to live on the laurels of, you know what, this, um, for foreign students, for example, especially over the last you know, previous four years or so, we were getting an onslaught of people coming to Canada because they didn't want to go to the United States. I'm not sure that that exists anymore, despite some of the things that go on down there. People still look at it as a very attractive place. And for Canadians, we're going to be subject to very aggressive recruitment by American firms to say, listen, we need the labor down here badly and we're willing to pay you handsomely for it. So, yeah, we got some issues. You might need to live in a gated community and you might need to own a gun or whatever. But for a couple hundred thousand dollars more than you're making today, you might make that move. So we've got to be offensive and defensive in our way to protect the talent that comes in here and to attract the right talent that gets in here. A lot of the, the challenges um, that, that our audience is, is facing isn't specifically related to, to the um, Canadian experience class and questions around, probably in agreement with a lot of what you're saying, Goldie, but questions around when, when will it restart? You know, the delays that we're seeing are worrisome. And so is there any more that you can share on how we're going to specifically address it? Sure, uh, look, uh, sorry, was that for Goldie or was that for me, Jenny? That was for you, Sean. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so look, uh, we, we don't have an announcement on the specific date of the next draw, but I can reassure you we're looking at uh, resuming draws in, in the near term on the Canadian experience class for federal skilled workers. Uh, one of the things that I think is really, really important though, is when we look at the uh, changes that were made during the pandemic, uh, they were motivated by a desire to ensure we could continue to meet the needs of the Canadian economy. So I don't want to communicate for one moment that just because the Canadian experience class was paused temporarily, uh, that we were not uh, welcoming as many economic refugees, or rather uh, immigrants or, or refugees for that matter. In fact, the number during the pandemic increased uh, when you look at the percentage of, of newcomers who were resettled as permanent residents. Um, it's really important, though, that we continue to uh, uh, welcome the people who are partway through the process, through those programs that we made available on a time-limited basis. But we do need to resume in the near future uh, draws for uh, federal skilled workers. If you actually look at the immigration levels plan, you'll see that over the next couple of years, uh, the balance is shifting back. And, and by uh, year three, there will be a record number of federal skilled workers, including through the Canadian experience class, that will be welcome to Canada. By no means do I want to communicate that there has been any kind of an abandonment of what I would argue is one of the most successful immigration programs anywhere in the world. And if I could just add uh, to build on a point that, that Goldie made, uh, I do think we need to continuously review how we can improve the strength of our system to welcome the people that our economy so desperately needs. One of the areas that I'm very excited to be pursuing right now is to add additional flexibility to the express entry system. We have a really beautiful system that can target people based on certain criteria that we set. But once we set them, it's really hard to change them. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is to pursue flexibility so we can respond to short-term needs, whether it's welcoming people into smaller communities that have the capacity to absorb people because they have housing, they have transit services. We can pivot to target sectors that are in the highest demand. We can target uh, people who are coming from a particular region that has the kind of educational institutions that will train the workers that we need in, in strategically important sectors. So building this flexibility into the express entry system is something that I'm personally digging into right now because I think it's going to enable us to respond in a more nimble way when we do see the pace of transformation is only increasing over time. I think and there, I there say are one, one quick thing about that is that you mentioned refugees a few times. There's a tendency to kind of gloss over these other programs and just focus in on the economic, right? The truth is they all fit. They all are part of your economic development strategy. I don't get a chance to do what I'm doing in my life if my grandparents weren't here so that my parents could work multiple jobs, right? Uh, refugees who've come in, I've had members, Kaelin Revenisky, you know, former CEO of Air Canada, 
landed here as a refugee, four or five years old, didn't speak a word of French or English, goes on and becomes, you know, such a successful business person and now giving back. That's the other thing about refugees and others, that there's even like a higher burden that they feel or responsibility they feel to give back, you know, million dollar scholarships at University of Ottawa. These kinds of things are made possible. You know, I think we've heard about the Syrian chocolate maker, so many others that have come here. And, and, and in fact, Statistics Canada just put out a, a, a data just a little while ago that said immigrants to Canada are more entrepreneurial, they're more risk taking and that they take that and, and are able to build businesses and grow businesses. So it, net net communicating the positive impact of this is, I think, key to maintaining the support for, for immigration, which I keep coming back to because I just don't want to take that for granted. Absolutely. In, in fact, you know. A question that I've been curious about is, you know, when we're determining the investments in the various pathways that could exist, how how do you trade off or how do you make the decisions on the real need to address labor shortage versus continuing to be a beacon of humanitarianism to, to refugees? So I'd love to pivot us into talking more about about the refugee. Yeah, look, this is a, an incredible, uh, incredibly important topic. And, and although we we are talking about the strong economic focus that we're bringing to Canada's immigration system, it's important to reflect on the fact that it's economic focused insofar uh, as you compare it to the other categories. But if you actually compare us to the international standard, Canada has a reputation for being one of the most welcoming and humanitarian based immigration systems anywhere in the world for good reason. If I look at, at 2020 uh, in particular, um, Canada resettled one third of the refugees that were settled anywhere in the world. This is a remarkable, remarkable achievement. One third of the refugees globally. Uh, but one of the things that we're seeing is, is that what we have particular commitments based on certain uh, humanitarian crises. If you look at the mission in Afghanistan, it's not a coincidence that Canada really stepped up its game to have one of the most substantial refugee commitments, not just per capita, but raw numbers of, of any country in the world. Uh, and it's because we have a connection uh, based on our, the mission there, the people who've helped us that we feel we owe a moral obligation to, to bring here. But if I can just focus in on the economic value of refugees, Goldie sort of made passing reference to the Syrian chocolate makers. Uh, Tara Kadad is one of my good friends now. He was the first Syrian refugee to be settled in Nova Scotia. And I know when his family was asking him what it was like, uh, he wanted to send a picture, but we were in the middle of a winter storm. So he Googled anti Ganesh in the summer and he sent them a picture of what it looked like in the summertime so they wouldn't be afraid. Um, and despite the fact that there's an awful lot of attention on that one remarkable global success story, the other Syrian refugees that I met in my community since I've been a member of parliament have opened restaurants, have opened an upholstery business, are participating in the arts. My community that I live in now, five minutes from my house, has become the example, I would argue, potentially globally, for the use of refugee programs for economic immigration. Glenhaven Manor, a long-term care facility, took 32 refugees from a uh, refugee camp in Kenya that are trained by the United Nations to work as nurses who are now providing care to people in a long-term care facility because we could not find the labor locally. And the difference that that makes for me is my friend's parents who are now getting to an age uh, that they need care in a long-term care facility, they still live five minutes from their kids instead of having moved to Halifax several hours yeah. away. There is a quality of life argument that by bringing in people who have that commitment to their community, who want to give back, that they actually permanently change the culture of our community and make it more dynamic, make it more welcoming, and allow us to continue to enjoy life in the communities that we've always called home. Yeah. I think it's a really important point for the minister because I think that one of the reasons we run the risk of losing some support for immigration is there's a sense that everybody wants to live in Toronto, right? Or everybody wants to live in, in uh, Vancouver, or in some cases, Montreal. Um, this is again where policy matters. I don't think we have put our collective brains to work to think about how can we get people to live because we have the mobility capability in Canada. I can't stop people from moving around. But if you incent the behavior that you want and you get them into the smaller communities and you give them exposure to a quality of life and community and build infrastructure around it, allow others to come into that community. Um, you know, you, you don't sit there if you've got a beautiful home, you got a nice job, you got your family and education and a, a religious place of worship you can go to if you're in Halifax or or wherever you are and you think about you know what I really want to do is spend five times the money on a house in Toronto and be in traffic for two and a half hours you don't think like that if you have the opportunity to build your business and you know and and, and build a quality of life um, that you want for your family I want to underscore um, a, a subliminal message that we've all talked about but I want to really bring it home because just yesterday I was talking to one of my members a very well-known brand um, who's a new CEO coming in from America and I said what's your ambition you're coming into Canada as a CEO what do you want to do he said, Gold, you know what really excites me is the opportunity to leverage the diversity of Canada. He said, I'm in the cuisine business. 
right? And the opportunity to, to work with people from so many different cultures and so many different places and, and really, you know, make Canada, this was his phrase, but kind of like the hub, you know, a, a place where we can experiment, a place that we can do things that we can then expand out into other parts of our global network. So there are so many levers that are available to us, right? But it does require us to also think strategically. Like I'm going to use one example, probably get me in trouble and I don't intend it to, but we have to look at policies that were designed for a different era and social policies in particular that you know, we want this and we want that. I have a member who told me in the construction industry said I can have a thousand people hired right now and working on a site the minute I they sign the paper. I can't find them Goldie. I can't find it, right? And so some of these restrictions come about because the people that we're trying to get into the country are subject to all kinds of things, right? Does it matter if someone you know, is, is speaking French in Vermilion to work on a construction site? We have criteria for all of these things. Let's make sure they go in. And by the way, Alberta is the most, uh, uh, my home province, I have to say this, but we have the most um, you know, bilingual programmings in anywhere outside of Quebec. So it's not about French, it's about saying, how do we make sure that there aren't structural impediments being put in the way to achieve other social policy objectives that are actually standing in the way of us achieving our economic policy objectives. If I can build on that point, I think there's a really interesting uh, anecdote that I can offer here. Um, we often do talk about, and look, policy does matter, but community supports matter every bit as much. One of the things that's really blown my mind at home is the top issue when you're knocking doors during an election cycle in rural Nova Scotia is people want doctors. Uh, healthcare uh, staffing shortage is a major issue. It's a major issue right across Canada, particularly acute in Nova Scotia. But you know what's become a more powerful recruitment tool for doctors rather than funding from provincial governments? In my community, we have a mosque in the town of Trenton now. And all of a sudden, people who have the skills to work as doctors in our healthcare system are considering small communities. Uh, one of the things that's really, really exciting to me when I had the conversation, when I figured out which job I was going to have when I met with the prime minister, he said, Sean, uh, I think my first reaction was, well, it's a bigger job than I thought you were going to give me today. Uh, and, and then he said, you know, I, I do want to say um, it's not a coincidence that I've appointed an immigration minister from small town. And uh, that's really sunk in for me. And to Goldie's point about making sure that policy matters, we're extending settlement supports to agencies that are working with smaller communities in rural areas. We are going to pursue that flexibility through the express entry system to get people to areas that have the absorptive capacity. We're going to continue to make investments in infrastructure to build out those kind of supports so we can have more of these services uh, that people depend on. And we've got a range of pilot programs that are directing people to areas where there is jobs available and services that can actually meet their needs that aren't just in downtown of Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver, which are all still very, very important destinations for people who are coming to Canada. But we can do more if we leverage the diversity of Canada, not just in our biggest cities, but also our smaller communities. Sean, it, it, uh, it raises the question of how, how do we have confidence in the, uh, in the through line between what we're talking about here, which is our clear uh, shortage and labor needs, related to immigration and the concerns that I think some Canadians have raised around unaffordable housing, shortage in healthcare, everything that we've just talked about in terms of the infrastructure gaps. And do you feel that, do you have confidence and do you see the through line of how these pieces are connecting so that we're actually able to support um, the immigration targets that we're targeting? I do. And this was the very first question that I uh, posed to my deputy minister to say, hey, can we marry our increased uh, commitments uh, with, with the need to invest in housing? Uh, th this priority is not lost on me. But I think to Goldie's earlier point about maintaining support for immigration across Canada, it's really, really important that we don't fall victim to what could become a very nasty argument here. There are some people, there are people I've met with, people who I work with in Ottawa, who honestly believe that the solution to our housing crisis is to welcome fewer newcomers. I disagree. The solution to our housing crisis is to build more houses. The reality is we need to invest in the services that are going to allow us to successfully integrate people. But when I meet with the construction sector, I met with the uh, uh, Carpenters Union in Ontario uh, just uh, uh, last week. They want more newcomers so they can help build more houses. If we actually invest in our economy by having people fill those gaps in the labor force, the return on investment will give us the public resources that we need to invest in healthcare, to invest in housing, to invest in transit. I can tell you when I look at the opportunity cost of not welcoming enough newcomers to meet the moment that we currently face given the scale of the labor shortage, that cost it would be far greater by an order of magnitude than the cost of building out the supports we need to integrate people. So the answer cannot be 
temper our, uh, our ambition when it comes to welcoming the people that our economy needs, that our communities need. It has to be to marrying that increased level of ambition through uh, record investments through the national housing strategy in public transit, through transferring more money to provincial governments as we've campaigned on, on primary care, on mental health, on long-term care. You can't do these things in isolation of one another. You have to look at the picture holistically. And if you invest in those services, welcome more newcomers to contribute to your communities and your economy, you will be far better off at the end of the day. I think that's very important for everyone to hear. And it, it also brings us to, um, I, th I think I'll, I'll actually bring us back because we're still getting questions on it, on now that we know how we can have confidence in the future, that's how we should be thinking about it. It does come back to what are we doing today or is there more that we're doing or how do we understand how we're expediting um, you know, the, the mechanisms and policy and tools in place in order to, and I'll, re I'll read this verbatim, leverage immigrant skills and experience outside of Canada before they even arrive to us. How do we expedite their um, accreditation? How do we make sure that international students have a clear path to settlements once they're here? How do you start to think about these problems? Uh, for me or for Goldie? I think it'll be for both of you. Okay, well, Goldie, I've been talking a lot. Why don't you go first and I'll, I'm happy to piggyback on it. Okay, well, I'll leave the, the clearly federal stuff to you. I just want to talk about the, the issue of foreign skills accreditation because that's not on, on you. Uh, that is something that really falls on provincial governments, but also these professional bodies. And um, again, I think we all have to look at our ourselves and ask, um, what am I doing to help address the problems out there? And am I making life better for the people that I'm working with and, and so forth. The, the protectionism is really ironic to me that I use that word because we're fighting it every day in the United States and other places, but inside our own country, we know we have interprovincial trade barriers and all these other things, but this, this foreign skills accreditation issue really lies at the feet of our professional bodies. I mean, we can't get nurses, we can't get doctors, we can't get engineers. And so we've got to have a mechanism by which people are brought together. I think governments need to use their convening power. And I think that's certainly something that federal government could do uh, to bring people together, provincial governments municipal and, and um, uh, professional bodies, but also businesses to say, look, what are your issues? How can we solve that? You know, what, like I said, in some cases, businesses have said, you want people to have in Canada experience, we'll give it to them. We'll give it to them because we know, <laughs> right, that once they get your accreditation, they're going to be available to us. They're going to make more money coming back to us, and we're going to be able to hire them to keep doing what's necessary. So we've, we've got to break this logjam. We've talked about this issue in election after election after election, but it's having a cost. And, and you know, the ministers, and I think, as I said, in the last year, doing a great job in getting the people who are already here permanent status but they were already here. We've got new people who are gonna be coming here who are gonna say, do I have to go through what those people went through? I gotta wait years and years and years before I get my accreditation. So use the convening power and let's you know, remind people that the consequences of your action are harming the country because that's exactly what's happening. Uh, sure, and look, if I can build on that, I agree with everything that, that Goldie said, particularly when he points the fingers at other levels of government. No, but in, in all honesty, um, I, I think he's right. Uh, when I have conversations with my provincial and territorial counterparts, I should give them credit uh, because they're seized with this issue too. I'm looking at some of the reforms that the province of Ontario has been putting in place uh, in recent years, and Minister McNaughton's really seized with this issue. So I, I, I although I, I jest, uh, I do think that there's some good work going there. Um, I think it's a perfect opportunity for us to come together, have a conversation to say, um, you might control the strings on regulating uh, the, the regulating bodies. Uh, if you're talking about uh, different professions and, and the, the bodies that regulate them in a self-regulated way. Uh, but one of the things that I think we can be looking at is to say, uh, rather than sort of, uh, if you look at the, the carrot or stick, I think this is a moment where you can say, we've got the carrot. We've just set a target for the largest number of newcomers who could be resettled in the history of Canada. We do not come into it with some preordained outcome of uh, which specific people are coming in here. We want to make sure we meet the needs of each community. And the needs in Nova Scotia might be different than in Ontario, might be different than in Alberta. And if we actually work with the different levels of government to say, what are your priorities? Where are your gaps in the labor force? What measures are you willing to put in place to make it easier for doctors, for nurses, for the skilled trades workers that we need to actually get here? Because I'm coming from this from a perspective where I'm saying, if you're going to make it easy for people to slot into these vacancies that we desperately need, we can create spaces for you to get those people here. I've mentioned on a couple of occasions that we can pursue flexibility in some of our systems to actually target those sectors that are most in need. If we hear that healthcare in Nova Scotia is at the top of the list and skilled trades are in Alberta at the top of the list, we can say, you sort out your foreign credential recognition, 
we can help you get the people here and we can help you get them here quickly. It's really a golden opportunity, I think, to revisit some of these things in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, because we're facing similar challenges, though the sectors may not be identical. I think it's a, the, the, the best moment in my life to be having this conversation, because we, have, we can leverage the immigration tools if we can help work with provinces and territories to solve some of the regulatory barriers and interprovincial barriers as well, I have to say. Uh, this would be a massive opportunity for us to grow the economy so we can continue to fund those services that Canadians enjoy. So I got to go to Toronto next week, Jenny. So I got to say something nice about the, <laughs> about, uh, the work that Monty McNaughton has done. Uh, I think Minister said it himself just today. There was an announcement, I believe around Bill 27 or something, looking at how to eliminate duplication of language requirements, um, eliminating some of the on uh, in-Canada experience that's necessary. These are the kind of, of, of self-made impediments. My dad likes to say the problem in Canada is we don't have any, so we make them all up. These are examples of them. Like these are not things that are necessary in today's world. So if we can look at where these things are grinding things to a halt, when we actually need people to come here and hit the ground running, I think Ontario, Alberta, a few others have really seized on the labor issue because they're acutely aware of the data. Everything that the minister said is applicable right across this country. It's not like someone in Canada has a different demographic than what the minister laid out at the beginning. It's the same in all 13 jurisdictions. It does sound like that there, there is so much that's um, happening in, on, on that topic, Goldie. How, how do we ensure that we're increasing employer engagement in immigration settlement? This is a question that's come up from our audience as well. Yeah, I think it starts with the, the need to, to work in partnership. First of all, I think it's attitudinal that business and government working together with labor and other academics and others is what Canadians expect. You know, we, I'll just give you an anecdotal example. Many, many years ago, one of our former board chairs, Paul Demery Jr., came in and said, I want to have something that I'm remembered by in terms of what I wanted to do is impact on policy. And, and when we did the research back then, I wasn't there, but the people who did the research back then said, okay, we're seeing that people are coming out of universities and colleges and not ready to hit the ground running in the workforce. So there was a gap. There's an identified gap and we said, okay, so what can we do about it? We convened, we use convening power, which I think is very important to bring together government, to bring together you know, universities and colleges and polytechniques. Some told Paul that it would have been easier to go after Middle East peace than to get these people together to work together, but it happened. They were able to come together. We ended up creating a, you know, a work integrated learning program. The federal government under Minister Morneau at the time, over $800 million was available to help these kids hit the ground running because that's about productivity. People don't want to hear that word, but making people more productive is one more good thing because it's going to make their, your life better and their life better. So I think they're just anecdotal examples of things that we can do to make things less cumbersome and less, because when we go abroad, the thing we hear the most is too much process, too much administration, too much delay. I got somebody else who's ready to roll out a red carpet for me here. You know, we've got to compete with that now. So we have, I'm noticing the time, we just have a, a few questions left. And so reminders to the audience, if there's anything else that is pressing, please do share it. Um, I wanna recap, Sean, what you what you've basically shared in, in terms of your commitment to, uh, to, the, to the prioritization of moving folks through the backlog that we know exists already and the commitment that the government has made with $85 million to really address these and the implementation of a digital system to really bring us into where we need to be. Um, but clearly there's a lot of concern around, around the backlog and uh, isu the issuance of, of what's necessary here. And so is there anything else that you can add or share um, with the audience in, in what we're doing? Uh, and if there's anything specific to student visas too, that question's come up a bit as well. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so look, j just to give a little bit of clarity, uh, the $85 million from the economic and fiscal update is a short-term injection of funds that's going to help bridge us to certain functionalities of the digital system that are coming on. We're actually seeing over the past couple of months alone, there's been more than 30,000 uh, uh, people in the inventory. I shouldn't say uh, uh, people, the total inventory has shrunk by 30,000 just in the last few months. So we're starting to see some progress because these investments are just really taking hold now. Uh, the specific areas where these uh, funds are going are to expedite work permits, study permits in particular, temporary residence visas, so people who are coming here to visit who are going to be contributing to the economy, and then some administrative issues around proof of citizenship and PR cards, which have run into um, operational stags really as, as a, a result of the COVID-19 pandemic on local operations. For study permits in particular, we bent over backwards to help post-secondary institutions last year, make sure that despite the challenges that we were facing as a result of the pandemic, that more than 99% of the applications that were made allowed people to get here on time for their academic year. 
This is really, really important. And we're going to take that same vigor that we applied last year to make sure that our institutions in a uh, industry that's worth more than $20 billion uh, are going to continue to have access to the people that, that we need. But just to be clear, $85 million does not solve all the problems. The digital modernization, to put this into perspective, uh, is an $827 million investment. We are seeing the new functionalities come online. There was nearly a quarter million people last year started to finalize their PR process by the use of a new electronic app. Uh, people can get updates on their phone, as I've mentioned, as to where their cases and family reunification as of two weeks ago. Uh, we're seeing new functionalities come online and we've been running a pilot with 10 to 20% of the cases through about 15 different lines of business that were being funneled through a digital application process. 17 of them will be 100% directed to that process today. And the advantage is when we actually digitize the system, a lot of people don't realize Canada has had a paper-based system until very, very recently for immigration in the 21st century. Is there a fax machine still, Sean? Somewhere? <laughs> oh, that many, many. But, but the real advantage when we have everything fully digitized, which is just around the corner, is that when our offices in Ottawa are jammed in at capacity, if we're having a slow day in London, our staff based in London can process the excess cases that need to be dealt with. We can leverage the system to our maximum capacity if we have a fully digital global network. That's the direction that we're going. And literally every month I'm seeing new features come online. So I'm very optimistic. The challenges we're facing were due to an acute and exogenous shock caused by COVID-19. The systems that we're putting in place are going to offer a permanent solution that won't just solve the COVID-19 related problems, but boosts productivity and efficiency within the department on a permanent basis for the next generation. Thank you for being so specific about the measures that are being put in place. There's no silver bullet and the commitment that, I, that I, you're trying to share in terms of what's being done, I think is very helpful for all, for all of us to understand. Uh, I'm just gonna share my last question to, to the both of you, um, which is more general than what we've been talking about in the past in, and really forward looking. So, you know, looking five to 10 years in the future, what, what worries you the most and what gives you the most hope? Um, and Goldie, I'll, I'll ask you to share your thoughts first. Um, look, personally, uh, you know, on this issue, we're worried about the, the, the demographics. They just are what they are. There's very little we can do about it, except the things that we're talking about. So making sure that we maintain the support for having that kind of, of, um, of robust uh, public policy. We are not this country if we didn't have immigration for the last hundred plus years. It's not the same Canada. And so to have the kind of Canada that we have and leave it behind for our kids better than we found it, this is going to be central to it. Um, in a more broad, broader way, um, in terms of, uh, of real risks out there, I'm worried about geopolitical risks all around the world. The world's changing. And as a country, and this is all about economic growth, the minister has been saying from the very beginning, this is about long-term economic growth. It's a driver for economic growth. So we've got to make sure that we get all our policies around these issues right. People look at geopolitical issues, your foreign policy, your trade policy, your you know, immigration policy. Uh, all of these things are things that people are looking at. Your tax policy, something else we hear a lot about abroad is saying, wow, you guys sure pay a lot of tax over there. Um, you know, Competitiveness issues like this, people are shopping. There's a much more sophisticated immigrant out there who's looking and they have options because they're aggressively being wooed. So these things connect together on the, on the downside. On the upside, we're Canada. Uh, talk about the greatest place in the world to live. We've got all the criteria, we've got all the elements, the characteristics, the can-do attitude, the, you know, the, the blessing and curse of geography sometimes, the ability to bring people from all around the world, but it's what you do with it that matters. And I think this is where um, really bold leadership, ambitious, uh, you know, with, uh, with a sense of purpose and a sense of vision, realizing that the neighborhood around us is changing and that what got us here isn't going to get us there. And I think with the right attitude of, as Canadians, which means celebrating success. We seem to celebrate it in the Olympics, but when our businesses do well, somehow that's a problem. You know, or when our individuals do well, that's a problem. We've got to just make sure that we change our culture. Look, if I can uh, add my two cents to this, I think Goldie's completely right to focus on the demographic uh, uh, challenges that we're facing. We're staring down the barrel of a gun. I think he's absolutely right to point to global crises. I would be remiss as somebody who uh, is, is amongst the youngest members of the federal cabinet, if I did not point out the fact that I've been uh, involved in climate advocacy since I was seven years old. Uh, but, but there's one other challenge uh, that I, I've been wrestling with uh, for the past um, six years uh, since I was first elected as a member of parliament. And it's this turn toward inward facing politics uh, that we're seeing. The idea that we don't need one another to get along. The, other, the, the idea that we may not see room for ourselves 
in a changing economy. Um, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, I saw for the first time in my life that this universal sentiment that we cared as much about our neighbors as we did about ourselves. Uh, I saw people welcoming the vulnerable. I saw people delivering groceries to seniors. I saw people doing deliveries from the food bank for neighbors they have never met. And it was a beautiful thing. As we come out of this pandemic, we need to do a better job of communicating to everyone that there's a place for them in the economy. People worry about, and this comes back to Goldie's first point, which I agree wholeheartedly with, we need to maintain public support for immigration. People are worried sometimes about the role that newcomers may play in our communities because they think it's going to bring change and with change comes uncertainty. But change is happening whether we like it or not. If we refuse to change, we refuse to adapt, we're gonna see our schools close. We're gonna see our hospitals close. We're gonna see young people leave. If we embrace newcomers and manage that change, we can make sure that there's space for everyone in our economy. And that's the kind of thing that I think about every single day. Thank you for those closing thoughts. And thank you both for sharing these very important perspectives as well as the many commitments that we're making um, in order to ensure that we continue to bring our economic migrants and refugees into Canada. Um, thank you, Sean and, and Goldie for your time, for the audience, for amazing questions and to our sponsor. I'm gonna pass it back to you, Joe. Thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, Minister Fraser and Goldie, thank you for joining us today. It's clear from our conversation that immigration is at the core of Canada's economic recovery especially as we emerge from the pandemic. Uh, I was heartened to hear how well aligned the government of Canada and the Canadian business community are for the need to modernize, accelerate, and enable um, a new immigration ecosystem for our country's needs, uh, both now and in the future. And Shauna Goldie, as an immigrant myself, I really appreciated hearing the personal immigrant stories that you shared. Uh, at the end of the day, this is truly a people-based opportunity, and, and as you said, it's ours to capture. Jenny, thank you for your expert guidance and moderation of today's discussion as well. Thank you again to our sponsors, RBC and Arrive and RBC Ventures Company. We appreciate your generous support of our programming. Thank you to our AV supplier, Van Valkenburg Communications and LiveMeeting.ca for making it possible for us to gather digitally today. Guests, we hope that you'll join us for some of our upcoming programming and events. On February 23rd, our expert panel focuses on the increased expectations of the S and ESG, social responsibility. We'll discuss increased investor attention to the social factors that help to drive returns and how it is increasingly important to the bottom line. And on March 3rd, we'll be back in person to host the Honorable Monty McNaughton, Ontario's Minister of Labor, Training and Skills Development. We hope you'll join us at both of these events. To learn more about our upcoming events, explore our website at canadianclub.org, browse our rich archive of past events, and check out our new updated membership categories with enhanced benefits at a variety of levels. Please consider becoming a member to support our club's work and mission. Guests, thank you so much for joining us. Please stay healthy and safe. We'll see you soon. <laughs>